Hi, this is Dr. Maggie Luther, and we're back with the choline series. So nutrigenomics is nutrition-based gene therapy, and you know, I find that with every gene that's studied, there's always numerous questions that go along with the functionality of that particular gene. Is that gene going to code for the protein, and then that protein's going to become an active enzyme? And then we sort of add to that the additional questions which begin to surface about protective effects, additive effects, uh, you can get reduction in effects of genes when they're mutated, you can even get neutralizing effects when you start to add other genes onto it. And before you know it, you have a lot more unanswered questions. So it's definitely an unraveling field and it's very interesting for certain. Um, it's by no way figured out, but you know, understanding how your diet and lifestyle affects your genes uh, is pretty empowering because it allows you to become better, you become in better control of your health and your health outcomes. So, you know, we think about how our environment affects our health. And, you know, a lot of us think about environment, outdoors, trees, woods, things like that. But when we talk about environment, it's really literally everything in the world in which you live that affects your health. So it's your indoor environment, it's your work environment, it's the environment in your car, or if you're a biker, you know, what you're surrounded by every day. And all of this influences our genes and how our genes are expressed. So it's really um, neat stuff. And hopefully as nutrigenomics continues to grow, we'll understand more and more about all the genetic polymorphisms and how to really utilize them to our advantage. Uh, the end goal, of course, which should always be individualized medicine and to cause no harm, is such a fabulous way of looking at how to help people heal rather than the conventional medical system of kind of routine medical care, uh, which doesn't allow for individual differences, right? So choline, this is part two of the four part choline series and in part one we really talked about the powerhouse nutrient. Please go back and uh, read that article, kind of talked about the Institute of Medicine making it a um, necessary nutrient and what the dosage levels are and why it's so important. There's two ways that the body can get choline. One is either from the diet and the other is from internal synthesis, endogenous production. Uh, you might see the word de novo synthesis. That's when your body makes it. Getting it from your diet is the easiest and most plentiful way to get it, uh, but you do have that internal production that helps your body meet its levels. So you have that backup process to help you meet your levels on a daily basis. And so we find that those who have choline deficiency with specific genetic polymorphisms, and we're going to get into that in just a minute, uh, have a higher tendency of developing non-alcoholic fatty liver. And this can also progress to liver and muscle damage. So it doesn't mean that if you don't have enough choline, you automatically develop fatty liver. What it means is that those individuals with specific genetic SNPs who simultaneously don't intake enough choline can't get enough into their body to allow it to do what it needs to do. So why does choline lead to fatty liver? Well, one of choline's main roles is to facilitate the transport of triglycerides out of the liver. And when this doesn't happen because of a choline deficiency, there's a buildup of triglycerides, and this causes apoptosis, which is cell death, and then subsequent leakage of cellular contents. And you can see a rise in AST, ALT, CPK, uh, most pronounced, you'll want to look at the ALT in your labs uh, above about 17 or 18 can be an indication that there's some fatty liver. The only other way to really diagnose fatty liver is through a biopsy. So um, the liver enzymes are the best first way to look at uh, what's going on in the body. Again, phosphatidylcholine, uh, check out part one, but it's super critical for cell membrane uh, performance. It's important for uh, brain health, neural tube development. Uh, it's really important, again, for packaging up those triglycerides. So we wanna make sure that we're getting plenty of it in our diet.
So what is that gene that when mutated can cause issues with internal choline production? Uh, it's called PEMT, phosphatidylethanolamine N methyltransferase. And it converts phosphatidylethanolamine to phosphatidylcholine by catalyzing three methylation reactions. Uh, and it primarily does this through uh, Atomet, which is adenosylmethionine, and it does it in the liver, and you'll end up with phosphatidylcholine. And so when you, when this gene is heterozygous, a single mutation or homozygous, a double mutation, you can have issues with producing enough phosphatidylcholine in your body. In the research, it appears that, uh, you know, for PMT, there's 98 single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, PMT5465 and PMT744G have emerged as the functional SNPs, meaning that these mutations will affect protein activity and possibly the choline requirements that you're going to need uh, from your diet, meaning you'll probably need more from your diet. PMT5465 has been connected with causing a loss of function and an increased risk of the non-alcoholic fatty liver. PMT744 uh, is located in the promoter region of the gene and it can affect the gene's expression. So it's associated with increased susceptibility to choline deficiency in women, um, potentially through altered uh, estrogen mediation. We find that women who are premenopausal, so um, all fertile women, if you have this genetic SNP, you're actually not as bad off because the estrogen seems to also be located on this um, polymorphism and it helps to regulate choline production. And so that's really good because we need more choline during pregnancy and lactation. Uh, it doesn't mean that you necessarily won't need more from your diet, but uh, mostly postmenopausal women and men will be affected by this genetic SNP and their endogenous production of choline. So again, you know, it always comes down to what is adequate intake for you. Um, if you have a gene mutation, how much choline should you take? Unfortunately, there's really no clear answer to that, uh, but the adequate intake is the best place to start. So for men, it's 550 milligrams a day. For women, it's 425. For pregnancy, it's 450. And for breastfeeding, it's 550. So, you know, start there. If you find that you do have a PEMT uh, SNP, you may want to increase your dosage level. There's, um, you know, a lot of good research on choline in uh, PubMed. You can do some searches and just see what they're doing with it to help improve pregnancy outcomes, help improve uh, the amount of choline that gets to the baby, and, and betaine, which is a choline um, byproduct in the milk when the mom's taking sufficient levels. And to find, again, those sources of choline in your diet, refer back to part one of the choline series. All right, that's all. Please leave your comments below. I look forward to answering your questions, and have a wonderful day.